Welcome to USAFBL Finger War Podcast. I'm your host, Levine Cunningham, and I'm excited to be chatting with Johnny of D Wood Fingerboards. Johnny is also known as D Wood Fingerboards on Instagram. Johnny, thanks for coming to the podcast. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How about you, Levine? I am much better now that we got through <laughs> uh, some some technical challenges. So we uh we had a nice uh good good technical challenges getting into this, and so I'm excited to finally get you on the podcast and telling your story. And it's gonna be a good time. I'm not gonna lie. I hope so, man. It's a pleasure, you know, to be here with you today, and uh, to be part of the USA FBL podcast. So uh, thanks for having me, and thanks for having D Wood. For people that may not know who you are, I would say you're probably one of the better premier deck makers out of Germany. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. I'm a passionate deck maker uh, since 15 years right now. 15? Yeah, that's correct. That is crazy. So you've seen a lot of a lot of history. You've seen a lot of just progress in the fingerboarding community. Oh, absolutely. In the fingerboard community and also in deck making. I believe it. I I can only imagine just seeing like the standards of how making decks has literally progressed over the last decade and a half. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, that's wild. All right. So you said I originally met you at Fast Fingers and then I was asking you where you're from and you literally said like a small town in the middle of nowhere. That's true. That's true. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a small town uh, in uh, the northern part of Germany. So the closest big city would be Hamburg. And yeah, as I said, it's really in the middle of nowhere. So um, no matter where you want to go, you have to go like one, two hours. It's pretty far, everything, you know? To like the next closest city? Yeah, to Hamburg, it's like uh, one and a half hour. Man, so you live a very quiet, simple life. I like that. Definitely, but it's nice here. <laughs> I, I bet. It's uh, not like exactly where you're from, but like just traveling through like all the small villages and stuff like that. I'm like, it is really peaceful and quiet. Like yeah. I live here in Indianapolis and I mean, it's just a big city, always sirens and loud cars and just things going on and stuff, which, you know, if you're one of those city goers, like you're like, oh, that's what I love. But like nothing, nothing like just kind of taking a step back and just living out in the country and just being able to just breathe clean air and just enjoy the silence. Like it's, it's amazing in my opinion. That's true. I mean, when I was younger, I also enjoyed like the, the city vibes and I like to go, even though it was far, I like to go to Hamburg and to other big cities but, you know, you get older, uh, you set uh, different priorities, so um, I enjoy the life out here. I think that's a true fact when you get older. Like, because I'm 30, 38 now, and so when I was younger, like, I couldn't even imagine not being in a city where, like, things were happening and there was always stuff going on. And now that I'm kind of getting older, like, I kind of just want a little small house, you know, in the middle of nowhere and just allow me to just kind of do my hobbies and peace and just get that, you know, that peaceful serenity for sure. Yeah, that's also what I imagine getting older. That's the lifestyle. That is the lifestyle. I think as we get older, we just kind of like want to migrate away from as many people as possible, I think. I think that's just the natural progression of humanity. Man, all right, so 15 years. 15 years of deck making, not of fingerboarding. It's way longer. Oh, man, so we got a, we got a historian. This is a, This might be a really, really good episode just right out the jump. I'm liking this. All right, well, take us back to the beginning. Like, take, like when when did you start fingerboarding, and like, how did that become a thing for you? Uh, yeah, it was it was a long time ago. Uh, it was actually the time FFI accounts were in uh, currency. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember FFI, by the way. Finger. I don't remember it in the early days. I caught it late, like 2019, 2020. Okay. Okay. Well. Um, well, I started, um, I think it was 2006 when I got the first time in touch with fingerboarding. Um, it was a little uh, keychain that I had that time, which was an old school shaped fingerboard. It was um, fully made out of plastic, so nothing serious. And the weird thing was that the graphic was actually on top of the deck and not on the bottom. And um, yeah, I was, I was just playing around with it at school um, flipping around, you know, nothing serious. And um, then I was like, okay, man, I want something like more professional. 
and uh, I went to the local toy store and uh, just searched for something, you know, better. And um, I ended up buying one of these um, toy fingerboards, which um, had like metal trucks and you were able to like uh, switch the wheels and so on. So it was not a tech deck. It was like cheaper version of a tech deck, let's say. And they were like, I don't know, uh, two or three dollars. Actually, there was a big issue because um, the axles were one part. So it was not like nowadays on professional trucks, you have the hanger and the base plate, which are um, which have uh, bushings in between to absorb the, uh, the landing and so on. But it was only one part. So then the issue was that every time I was like landing, like after, let's say, one or two weeks, the axle was breaking because there was no absorption and uh, the axle was breaking into two parts and then I was not really able to use it anymore. So I was getting myself like all two, three weeks uh, a new setup. I mean, back then they were cheap, so it was not a big deal. And um, yeah, I was, I was then pretty demotivated because, you know, like buying all the time new stuff. And I was a kid back then, so uh, not so nice. But uh, then I started to look online for a way better solution. And then this actually changed my life because I saw fingerboarding is actually a thing. You know, before it was just a toy for me. But then I saw, you know, Black River, Mike Schneider and all that stuff. You know, I saw all these YouTube videos from um, also from Close Up. I don't know if you remember Close Up. I remember Close Up. Do you remember the, mm -hmm. the old videos they did in the past with the turntable? Where I a part was, was placed on a turntable and was turning around? I remember seeing videos. I just don't remember if that was them or not. So possibly, yeah. And I also remember it, that being in like the uh, Fingers of Fury video, I think, or maybe it was Flying Fingers where he had a turntable and he was doing that. But maybe that was yes. close up. Like my memory is a little foggy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, they had this popular video. I think it's uh, it was uploaded like 17, 18 years ago. So quite a long time ago. And um, when I saw these videos, I saw that you are actually able to make like real tricks on these fingerboards. Um, which I was not really used to before because, as I said, I was just flipping around and just playing with it. And then I saw, okay, you can do real stuff on fingerboards. And um, there's more than just, you know, these plastic toys. There are wooden fingerboard decks, professional wheels. And I was, you know, diving deep into that topic and, uh, you know, watching all the time Mike Schneider's videos. Then I decided to get myself, you know, professional gear, which was uh, the close-up. I don't know if the brand still exists, I'm not sure, but uh, back then it was the, the G1. So you were able to get a com full complete setup for like, I don't know, $25 around. And uh, you had trucks, you had wheels, um, you had uh, the deck and grip tape on top and a few of uh, stickers. And I remember actually the wheels were not like basic wheels. They were, um, I still got, got them here. With me, I don't know if you can see that, but um, little black wheel. Okay. These were made of um, the same material, actually, like uh, skateboard wheels are made. So kind of urethane. So probably these were the very first urethane wheels back then. It was special because they had uh, a metal bush. I think it was made from brass. Metal bush inside. So you had like a better uh, performance uh, compared to basic plastic wheels. And uh, this was actually like my first ever professional setup. I was really getting into it. I was starting, you know, making all these tricks, build, building like different ramps and so on. And that was my first setup. I learned the first trick, like Ollie, kickflip and so on. And this actually motivated me to continue with my journey. I think once you land like your first kickflip or your first flip trick, like you're hooked, you're locked in. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it took me a while. Uh, the ollie was easier, but the kickflip, you know, because the ollie, you always have your fingers on the deck, so it's not a big deal. But flipping, you know, you just let it off your fingers and then you need to uh, to catch it. You know, that's the heavy part. And so it took me a while to learn the kickflip. But uh, yeah, after some time, I made it. My first flip trick was the kickflip. And it was, uh, I mean, theoretically, it was a shove it, pop shove it. But <laughs> my first kickflip was like, 
purely on accident like i was hopping off of a three ring binder like i was awing off of it and it actually like fully barrel rolled rotated and <laughs> i don't even remember if i landed it or if it was close enough to a land but like it got me to a point where like i was excited to try to do it over and over again and i remember trying it for like hours and then like literally landed it and i was i was hooked like it was it was done that was a game changer yeah, the good thing is when you, when you learn like the first flip trick, like a kickflip, for example, then I think the rest is coming uh, like uh, pretty pretty quick. Like tree flips, tree flips, for example, or heel flips. I think they got pretty easy when you learn uh, the first flip trick. Definitely, there's something always about the kickflip, just because you know that it requires a specific movement control. Like it's there's it's the science I feel like behind it in comparison to some other things. So. Man, all right. I didn't mean to interrupt your uh, your story down memory lane for sure. Continue. Uh yeah, man. Uh, so I was I was at a point where I was really like uh, um, developing, you know, love and passion for fingerboarding. I had a little demotivation because I was actually the only one in my area, um, you know, fingerboarding. So I had I remember I had one friend at school. He was also fingerboarding, but you know his. He's like, um, let's say his passion for fingerboarding was just only for, let's say, half a year. And then after that, he quit because, you know, he started saying, like, it's childish and whatever. Um, so I was really the only one in my area uh, fingerboarding for a long time. And uh, I remember I, I tried to convince my other friends uh, and to get them into fingerboarding. But, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, they were not really, like... Um, trying to get it into like a professional way. They just used maybe a fingerboard for one week or two weeks and then that was it, you know. I was like looking online for some other people that shared the same passion. And then I ended up on forums like the FFI, Finger Flip Inc. I ended up on uh, fingerboard.de, which was the German version of FFI. I ended up um, also because I have family in Poland. I have a big, big part of my family living in Poland. So um, I was also on uh, Fingerboard Reloaded, which was the biggest forum in Poland for fingerboarding. And uh, another one was called Underground in Poland, also a forum. And that was where I started like to get into and um, getting in touch with other people, you know, having the same passion. And this was nice for me because as I told you before, I was the only one in my area. So it was nice to see at least people online sharing the same passion and just uh, get in touch with them and then, and, and, you know, talk about tricks, about stuff and whatever. So um, that was really nice that time. You know, since I was living pretty far, I was not really able to um, get to any like meetups or events. Also, I was a kid at that time. So, you know, I, I cannot just... Uh, with let's say 10 or 11 years get into the train and just travel <laughs> all Germany <laughs> on the other side I don't have the money oh so uh, as a kid so um yeah that was that was my struggle that I had that time um so everything like community related was more online for me than in real life um but still I had fun and um then on the holidays, I remember I always was going to Poland to my family and they live pretty close to a big city. So I was able to see the people from the forum in real life. So I was going to the um, meetups and, and events. I remember they had uh, some skate shops um, that were doing little events and meetups in a shopping mall. And then I just uh, met for the first time, like real other fingerboarders, which was a really nice, you know, a moment for me. And um, yeah, I enjoyed that time seeing seeing other uh, fingerboarders in real life and having fun with them. And even if it was just a, a little meetup at McDonald's and we were just enjoying our cheeseburgers while fingerboarding, it still was fun, you know? No, that's awesome. So I don't really know too much about the Polish scene. I mean, it's, it's obviously growing, but I mean, like, you know, any companies, events, like people that are kind of hosting those things over there? If you would ask me like over 10 years ago, probably, <laughs> because, you know, many things changed. Uh, I mean, we had we had a peak in fingerboarding in 2011, 12. And um, that was the time when I was really into everything. And um, later, you know, many forums like got down. So they were mm -hmm. shut down. And I think also the scene was like, 
yeah, going pretty much down and had a down phase. So I think many things changed in Poland. I remember many, many brands from, from back in the days, uh, but they don't exist anymore. And I honestly don't know how, you know, to get back in touch with the people, if they still think about it, I know, but mm -hmm. how to get in touch with them. I think the only way, way is Instagram, but, you know, I, I have no clue how to get back to these people. So I honestly don't know what's going on there. I remember only the one big brand that still exists is Grand Fingers. I don't know if you ever hear from them. Um, that's a wee, originally a wheel maker, which then started making also decks and concrete ramps and so But uh, this is the only brand I think still exists. And then there's the Finger Shop, uh, which is a distributor for uh, different, uh, you know, different fingerboarding gear, like d decks, for example. And um, yeah, but honestly, I have no clue what's going on right now over there. No, understandable, understandable. I know when you're looking at fingerboarding on a global scale, it's really, really hard to keep up with what's going on, what's happening, who's doing what, who's still doing stuff, who's not doing stuff anymore. Like there's just a lot of, a lot of pieces that are moving and nothing stays the same, I guess. So you always got to constantly kind of keep tabs on what's going on. Otherwise you just completely fall out of what's even happening anymore. So it, it's definitely difficult. And I feel like the only way to even get that information is through Instagram and Instagram, in my opinion, is it doesn't, tell you the full story it's just like kind of glips and pieces of it and so it's hard to make out what's really happening It's true, that's true. And, uh, you know, Instagram is, uh, you know, it always depends on the algorithm, what's what's uh, Instagram is showing up to you and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, I honestly, I met some, I think one or two guys from Poland through Instagram uh, who are fingerboarding, but it's not like you can, you can go there and look for some specific people, you know, Mm it's always like uh, going, you know, what the explore page is showing you that you see, you know. That's the point. No, I I understand that completely. I wish that there was a a better method, but I I honestly don't have any answers to that at all. Yeah, I, I think I think the the forums that we had back in the days, I think that was like the, the best way to to get the community together. And um, even though it was only within the country, but uh, you know you had um, you had it really easy because you were just um, registering in this forum. And automatically everyone in your country showed up that was fingerboarding. And that was so nice. And you were able to like um, message people, get in touch with them. You were able to see um, where events are taking place and so on. So you had like that one general page where you have been going on and you saw everything and you saw different brands, you saw fingerboard content and so on. Um, yeah, this is this is what I really miss from back in the days. I mean, we have we have, for example, in Germany, the fingerboard.de was reactivated some years ago. I know that, but uh, for Poland, I think everything has been shut down, and also FFI is shut has been shut down back in the days. So there's nothing really comparable nowadays. Yeah, I mean, Facebook groups to an extent, but there's just a lot of missing people. kind of sort of replaced it but i don't know if that's like a full replacement for sure Yeah, I, I think so, too, because, you know, you know, Facebook nowadays, to be honest, when you when you ask a 15 year old kid, uh, he would say probably he does not have Facebook and it's like for old people and, you know, <laughs> yeah that's when i realize i'm getting older whenever you start talking to people about you know facebook and stuff and you're like i only use facebook for groups and marketplace and i'm like oh okay <laughs> and i'm like oh i guess i'm showing my age a little bit and so yeah everybody's using like tiktok and snap and all these other things and i'm just like i don't know i don't really have any interest in it maybe it's just because i'm getting older but i don't know it's It's just, we need like a dedicated spot, basically kind of like the forums and things like that. And I don't know who needs to step up and kind of make that happen, but someone needs to step up and definitely make that happen. That's true. That's true. Because I'm I'm missing the times, you know, being on FFI, and being in touch with fingerboards from all the world, and um, yeah, you know, with me it's the same. I feel too old for all that Snapchat and TikTok stuff. You know, it's yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's in in some way it's you know positive because you also can see content and you can share content, but. 
Ah, man, I feel too old for that, to be honest. <laughs> I know, but I feel like you can't get a community behind it. That's the kind of the thing. So like you can share the content, the content can get viewed, but I feel like there really isn't like a way to like really talk about what's being seen. And so I don't know, it's, it's like, because even like Instagram, like you can do the same and there's like the comment section and stuff, which is fine. But like, there isn't really like conversations being held like in the comment sections, really. It's just really, you know, fire emojis and stuff like that. But there isn't really like a lot of true. engagement type stuff. So that's, that's, that's totally true. And, uh, you know, we live up in a time where people only like scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and, you know, that's it. And, uh, if, if you have luck, they like it. If not, then not. And, you know, that's it. So it's, yeah, really unpersonal, I think. Man. And I know the last time I saw you was at Fast Fingers, Fast Fingers 21. Where, like, how far of a journey was that for you? So I know you're in the same country, but I know Germany is actually quite large. Um, yeah, we had a long trip uh, to Schwarzenbach, how it's called. <laughs> And uh, it was, I don't know, six, seven hours by car, one way. Okay. Uh, so it's pretty far, um, especially when you live in the middle of nowhere as me. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it was a big dream of mine. So um, I actually wanted to be minimum once in a lifetime at this event. And I think uh, this, this time Fast Fingers was like probably the biggest ever and the most international ever. So uh, I think we made it right that we just had it over there. And uh, if, I mean, if, if we would not be there, probably um, uh, we both wouldn't sit here right now. I feel at some point this would happen, but I definitely think that meeting each other at the event sped the process up quite a bit. He, just those in-person interactions is the reason why I love events, whether it's, you know, a small event, big event, like just any events, just because you get to meet people and interact with people and kind of network and just it's the friendships and the partnerships and just the lifelong relationships that like kind of come from events is quite crazy. And like my very first event ever, like I still talk to people that I met from there and like i've been to several events obviously throughout the years and like i still have you know friends now in different like countries and states and just all over the place and just it's kind of a it's an awesome feeling when you kind of look back at it and be like you know what like if i'm ever taking a trip out that way i can always just hit this one guy up that we met at an event and we can go hang out and go chill and go do stuff and it's just cool stuff yeah, that's true. You know, those events, you know, they support the community and they, they bring uh, each other closer. So um, it's pretty nice. And this is what I like because, you know, now I'm an adult. I am I have the possibilities, let's say, to, to go to these events back then, you know, um, due to lack of money and being too young, I was not able. So now I'm able to, you know, at least uh, be at some of these events. Um, not all, but, you know, because... Back then, you were young, you had no money. Now you have money, but no time. So <laughs> things change a lot, you know? No, I understand that. 12-year-old me is like, you You made it. Like, you went to Fast Fingers. Like, you You did it. Like, you achieved the, you achieved the dream. That's true. That's true. You know, that was, that was one of my biggest dreams in, in my childhood. And, uh, yeah, finally, after many, many years, I made it. Yeah, well, for me, like, I've always wanted to go. And then when I finally had, like, you know, grown up money where I could go, like, you know, they didn't really have it back in like 2020. And then like COVID hit, and then it just became a thing. And then as soon as they said, hey, we're gonna do an in person, like, you know, fast fingers, I'm like, doesn't matter what's going on, like, tell my job, like, I'll be back next week, like, I'm, I'm going <laughs> like, so is this your first fast fingers? Uh, yeah, my first Fast Fingers, I had, um, I think the biggest event I was before Fast Fingers was in uh, 2009. It was the S ASI Berlin, which was the German championship um, that was um, organized by TKY together with Black River. And I remember that really good because, you know, it was my very first big event, commercial event. And um it was of course held in Berlin. So I had luck that, you know, my, a part of my family was living in Berlin 
And I was I was a kid back then, so normally it would be no option for me to get to Berlin to such an event as a kid. But um, as my family or part of my family was living there, I could convince my parents, you know, to uh, bring me there. And uh, the next plus was that it was during the holidays. So even better for me. And yeah, I convinced my parents to to just uh, bring me there. And um, yeah, I was I was then going to my family and um, I was a little kid back then, so it was crazy. And um, yeah, I got to the event and then I saw, you know, all the people, all people, you know, that shared the same passion as me. And um, it was also crazy, you know, seeing adult fingerboards, you know, from from a view as a kid, you know, it was a little weird back then. Uh, I mean, nowadays it's totally normal for me, but back then seeing adult people, uh, it was a little crazy. And um, yeah, I enjoyed that pretty much because that was also my first time seeing Black River Parks in real life. That was, you know, a big thing for me as a kid. And uh, yeah, had a bunch of nice talks, nice, nice conversations. Um, I met TKY in person. Um, I met many, many others like uh, Martin Ehrenberger, So the founder of Black Rubber, um, who else? I met uh, Elias Asmuth. I don't know. Do you remember Elias Asmuth? Unfortunately not. I feel like I need Oh, to. really? Yeah, Levi, man. I know. I know. You're putting me on the spot. I'm like, the name's not sounding <laughs> familiar at all. Maybe if I saw the face, because I'm a face person. uh, yeah, Elias Asmuth was actually um, 15 years ago. He was uh, uh, maybe, let's say, the Ger German version of, um, of Mike Schneider. When it comes to being, you know, like a pro and famous fingerboarder, he was like the, the the champ in Germany. Yeah, he was actually the face of Black River back then. And um, I, I met him in person, which was really nice. He was, you know, my big idol uh, back then. So uh, I was really happy to, to meet him and to see him fingerboarding in real life. And um, yeah, I met many, many other people like, I don't know, for example, Kata from Fingerboard Store. Uh, I met um, uh, Harry from Hero Rams. I don't know if you remember uh, I remember Harald those, Schön. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I met him uh, back then. That was actually the time when he like uh, launched his his Rams, his Harriers. And um, who else? I met people like Nico Frank, which is also a, a pretty known fingerboarder in Germany. And um, also, I I did that time. I did the legendary picture together with uh, TKY, um, a picture that we remade fifteen years later at Fast Fingers. I don't know if you Oh saw that. yeah, I did see that. You did a uh, a fifteen. It was a uh, one picture from fifteen years ago, and then a current picture with Correct, you guys. That is correct, probably correct. one of the coolest things I've seen in a while. Like just the history between you guys. Like it's that's a cool thing. I'm glad you actually posted that. That made my day. Before uh, we went to Fast Fingers, I just um, saw or find actually the old picture. And I just took took a picture of it with my phone and I said, okay, I need to show that to TKY. Um, because, you know, exactly 15 years gap in between. That's so crazy. I met It us is crazy. at ASI back then. So, yeah, I just, just went to him and said, hey, man, look at this picture. And then he was like, oh, yeah, we need to remake a, a, an, an actual version Yeah, what should I say? You see the difference? Well, actually, there's not many differences, but I managed to grow a beard within the last 15 years. <laughs> this is this is you know something super like uh, iconic and a big milestone because th that shows how important you know these events are and um, and meetups. So yeah. Well, definitely. And I know that, you know, ASI Berlin is doing a, they're struggling a little bit and I'm going to put a link in there in our description for you guys to be able to contribute to their Patreon account. It's kind of like a GoFundMe type deal to help the store stay alive and continue to run for hopefully another, you know, seven, 15 years. But I mean, we can't allow ASI Berlin to not exist anymore just simply because of 
how many people they've enriched all of the memories the community like i mean it's it's a big ordeal and like when i hear stories of like you know you showcasing a picture from 15 years ago and then a current picture and just like it's almost like nothing has like changed like you just picked up where you guys left off type of thing and like we can't allow stuff like that to just simply just disappear so definitely if you guys have the ability to definitely go support the asi berlin shop and I don't know why I say ASI is Ozzy. <laughs> American here, I'm sorry. <laughs> I went over there in Berlin and they were telling me the exact same thing. I was like, why are you guys saying ASI? It's Ozzy. But yeah, definitely support the definitely support the shop, especially if you guys have local shops and stuff like that to you guys as well and events. Like definitely support them any way, shape, or form. I've been in the States and in the States you have many of, of these places, maybe not one to one the same, but but comparable. Uh, and in Germany, we have, I think this is the only place we have, you know, so um, we definitely need to try our best to uh, keep them alive. And then I know that you just got back from a trip here from the States. Like you were actually here for like a week, maybe two. No, in the US? Way longer, way longer. Way longer? <laughs> yeah, we've been four weeks in the States. Oh, wow. The official holidays. We yeah, can only, yeah. We can only dream of such things over here. <laughs> oh really is it is it that bad or uh if you're lucky you get about if you have a good job you can get like two weeks of uh pay time off oh really if you're lucky but yeah most people like it's it's uh not a thing not a thing we do stuff on the weekends here that's about it maybe, but definitely tell maybe... us uh tell us what you did what you saw i know i think you went out to slush cold spot and some other places so kind of tell us the journey uh, yeah, we, we did a road trip. Uh, actually, we just uh, rent a car, landed in, in LA, uh, rent a car, just picked it up and uh, started our journey um, through four different states. So we made California, Arizona, Utah and Nevada. Uh, mostly we spent time uh, at the national and state parks and visited all of them. Yeah, also made it to some big cities where um, nearby we had a few fingerboarding locations so we had you know to get um, to them to you know just check them out and represent our brand um, for example we've been uh, in Arizona in Phoenix at uh, the Unity shop um, I don't know if this is known to you, but I guess, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you didn't shop. Uh, yeah, we've been there, had a nice time. Um, and then we have been also at um, the Vault Pro Scooter Shop in Inglewood in California. We have been two times at uh, Slush Cult, uh, first time at the beginning of our trip and then at the end when they had their store session. That's cool. So you got to meet like Fingerboard Christopher and all those guys then. Fingerboard Crest, Christopher, and 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 uh, Jake FB actually mm -hmm. have not been there that day. Oh no! So, but uh, I mean, I saw both of them at Fast Fingers and also okay, had, yeah. like, nice conversations with, with Jake and so. So, um, well, that's crazy. One weird thing for me about the Vault is that. I've known that like you can buy stuff from them online, but I had no idea until like probably a month ago that they actually had like a physical, I don't even know if it's a storefront. I don't really know much about it, but I just found out like they had parks and stuff in a little mall kiosk or something where you can go in and go sesh those things. Yeah, it's 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 a big physical uh store. You you just get in and um then the first thing that comes in front of your eyes is a big park from, I think, Tiny Skate? Tiny Ramps. Uh, tiny Ramps, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Tiny Ramps, yeah. Uh, uh, tiny Ramps, uh, this is the first thing you see. And then you go further, uh, they have like a, let's say, back room. And uh, everyone can get there in for free and fingerboard. And then uh, you just ask them for access. And uh, yeah, then you get in and then you have uh, you have another big uh, tiny park. You have, no, you have two, actually two of them. And then you have a Black River playground with uh, several ramps on top of it. And uh, yeah, you can just uh, have a good time there. Well, that's definitely gonna be on my list of places to go visit and stuff here within probably, you know, sometime in 2025 for sure. So I was just like, man, like, I thought I knew all the places, but apparently like there's some scattered places out there that I'm still, still unaware of. 
yeah, that's that's a nice thing about the States. You know, you got a couple of these places. So, um, yeah, but uh, what we liked, what we liked a lot about um, the vault was that um, we have been two times there and both times it was not crowded. I think there was like one or two people only. So you had access to like every park um, because, you know, so sometimes or for example, to, to, to name it the best is Fast Fingers. You know, it's, it was sometimes you struggle to get to a park because it was so crowded and so on. So, yeah, that was really nice at the vault. And uh, yeah, it's a really nice place. I can highly recommend it. Right on. Well, shout out to the vault. All right. Well, let's talk about the brand D Wood. Like when when did it start? Like what kind of inspired you to to start the company? Oh yeah. Um yeah, before I start, I need to tell you that you know D Wood is a brand with history. So there's a whole story behind, you know, what D Wood is, why D Wood has been started and why it's called like that. I tell you this in advance because, um, because you know, nowadays things change a lot with fingerboarding brands. Today, people see really big money in fingerboarding. So they purchase just like 3D printed molds with an unpersonal stock shape. And even before they receive the mold, you know, they already announce their first stock and start, uh, you know, their marketing campaign. So um, what don't I want to tell people their secrets. Sorry. I'm like, don't be telling people their secrets. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. What I just just uh, want to tell you is that you know um, the purpose of D Wood is you know passion and fun and not big business, so this is what I what I'm trying to to express, and so yeah, how everything started. Let me break it down. Um, sometime I think you know 2007 2008, I was uh, having my fingerboard collection and I was thinking that the decks I had that time were quite boring. So, for example, my close-up back then, it was just like a blank deck with nothing on it, no color, nothing. So I just uh, took it and dyed it red and uh, just um, put some clear coat on, did some finish. And I liked it way more. So it had a, like a personal touch. That was actually where everything started. So I, I started to modify most of my decks I had back then from other brands. And yeah, you know, I, I did some, some like, you know, fake bottoms or you know, tie dyes, however you want to call them. I did hand painted graphics. I put on some paper graphics. So I, I wanted to make every deck special in some way. And uh, this is actually where the journey started. And this is also where the name comes from because the D stands for designed. So it's designed wood. Okay. So uh, so there's, there's real meaning uh, behind the name. So it's not like we take a cool word, which sounds super nice and fancy and uh, take it as our brand name. No, it's it's a real meaning. Yeah, and this is where everything started. And uh, then, you know, some, some people online were asking, oh yeah, could you maybe like uh, um, give my deck a personal treatment and so on and um, I was like, okay, it makes no sense to to let the people send them their deck to me, do something on it and resend it. So I was thinking, why not making my own decks and adding my personal touch and design to them? So this is this is where the deck making itself started. It was in 2009. I was like, okay, I, I need to do my research, how, how to make decks because you know, back in the days, making fingerboard decks was a secret. You know, nowadays you go on Google, you put in deck making, and then you got everything. You got molds, you got veneer, you got totally everything. You got um, tutorials on YouTube and everything. Back then, we had none of this. Nothing. You had, you know, you had to find out how everything is made. And that was a real struggle. I know if you remember the, the tutorial of how molds are made from uh, Taylor Rosenbauer. I know of Taylor Rosenbauer. I don't think I remember the that video in particular yeah he was he was actually um opening up the secret uh of how fingerboard molds are made because 15 years ago when you googled fingerboard mold nothing showed up nothing mm -mm. the only thing i could find was uh doing like these bondo molds was which i ended up trying to do and failed miserably at it yeah that's that's also how i started um i i have some some examples here of how d would actually started i have a bunch of them since since oh, you know wow. I, I did i did a lot of molds and testing you know this is how they looked like back in the days mm -hmm. 
And um, yeah, I, I started making these Bondo molds. I used also other materials like um, resin, for example. This mold is made out of resin. I used even concrete, which is crazy, but I tried it at least. Um, I also used um, wood. So yes, that's what all of my molds look like when they came out like Bondo, but everything was just warped and misformed. It was bad. That's that's true, but this is actually where the D wood journey started. So I made a, a bunch of these Bondo molds, probably like over hundred. And um, I had during that time I had like different shapes. And from two thousand nine to two thousand eleven, I was only busy with development. This is something that is not common for Fingal brands nowadays, since everyone throws his products on the market. But um, but I did it different. I First, wanted to, you know, get to a certain point where like the shape is kind of perfect for myself. The quality is kind of perfect for myself. And this is where I spent almost three years in. So I was I was doing different shapes. I was doing uh, I, I was trying, you know, different materials and so on. My very first decks, I can just show you some. Um, so this is, for example, Generation 2 from DWOOD with an hand engraved DW. This is another one. And uh, all of the shapes are really uneven. So mm -hmm. I was working a lot, you know, to get them, um, you know, more even, more like symmetrical. And then I had progress with the uh, Generation 3, which is that one. Okay. I got a shorter wheelbase. There we go with a complete setup and uh, yeah, pretty deep concave, uh, high kicks. And um, yeah, I was trying to get, you know, even closer to my like uh, perfect shape. I tried different materials. Um, first I did four ply decks, then I switched to five ply decks. Yeah, I was, I was getting closer and closer to, to what really matches my taste and uh, at the at a point, I realized that, okay, with Bondo molds and other materials, I cannot, you know, get um, to the point where I say, okay, the DAC looks really good and it's even and everything. So I had to switch to another level to get more professional. And this is where I started to um, develop a shape um, in a, as a CAD model, so in a 3D, so a digital version. And um, I was creating uh, the shape to my specifications, then did a little bit of prototyping. And then I came up with the G6. And this is also one of our current uh, shapes. Um, and I decided, okay, I need, you know, a better material for the mold. So I ended up using metal. So I just um, asked someone to a metal worker uh, to get me a CNC mesh and metal mold. And uh, then I ended up with the G6, the generation six, which came out 2011. And also I was at a point where I was really satisfied with the quality of my decks at that uh, moment. So um, then I started, you know, um, going public with my decks before that time, so from 2009 to 2011, it was only like development and all the decks that I created during that time, I mostly just, you know, give, gave away to, to other friends online, or maybe when I did a trade, I just um, threw one of my decks into the box so other people can test them out. But um, before I did not really sell them. And then 2011, the time came and uh, I was having this, this like perfect shape. It was 100% even. It was a total game changer for me. I, I had always had like the goal um, because this is when we come back to the name Design Wood, I always had the goal to um, actually offer one of one decks. So no mass production, no mass design. And uh, every deck was, you know, unique in its way. And, um, you know, by like special colors, hand painting, special veneers and so on. And yeah, when I launched in 2011, the G6, um, I had big success. I received uh, positive feedback. I was also launching on FFI. So I had like an international audience and uh, yeah, I started selling the decks. Then I had a pretty high demand. And uh, 2011, 2012 were, as I said previously, um, 
the peak in fingerboarding. So yeah, I was doing a lot of decks, you know, I was in school that time. And I remember after school, I came home and started, you know, sanding the decks and so on and uh, just getting them out of the mold and drilling holes. And so I came to a point where um, the demand was so high that I was not able to cover it myself. So I, I just asked a friend of mine to, to join and to help me. And uh, yeah, he did so. And uh, he supported me, especially in the hand paintings. So he did a lot of the graphics back then. Yeah, that was actually the the, the way how, how DWIT was developed. We also had not only decks, but we added at some time, we added um, fingerboard tape. I remember my first tape was two millimeter thick. So, you know, not, not comparable to nowadays. And... I remember those days. Oh, really? I remember the first time I was introduced to foam and I remember it being really, really thick and I didn't like it. Of course, you know, I grew up as a tech tech kid. So like the actual like skate tape, the grip, like actual like sandpaper tape basically like was the go-to. And so like anybody that went from sandpaper to foam, the beginning, like we're like, ah, oh, there's no way we could ever go to foam. And then like, once you get used to foam, you can never go back to sandpaper. And so it's, it's a weird love hate relationship for sure. But yeah, I remember the days, the thick boy days, as far as the two millimeter those are that's crazy yeah i i, I think um i think it was really unusual um e even back in the days but uh the tape itself had a had a great success because you know the, the feeling the performance was great um but then uh someday we, we changed to to um you know the the normal basic one millimeter tape mm -hmm. you have nowadays but it's it's also made in germany so it's not not uh, any of these you know like purchased uh, from far away tapes and um, yeah, what, what else? We had also um, a limited stock of, I don't know if you can see it, granite benches. Ooh, that looks nice. Right over here. Yeah, we had only one stock of 10 benches. And um, yeah, this was like a one-off um, thing. So um, yeah, we sold, we sold them and never started recreating them because um, it was a struggle because, you know, getting the material and so on. Uh, you know, it's... It's really difficult, but um, this is also something we did, but mainly we focused on um, decks. And I remember in 2013 and 14, there was a down in fingerboarding and the whole scene. At the same time, you know, I had uh, to set my priorities in life a little bit different because, you know, I was getting older and life got serious. So, um, yeah, I had a focus on, you know, education and then later a career and so on. So I decided to, you know, quit being active in the fingerboarding scene. So personal as a fingerboard and also with D-Wood, um, because also the demand at that time was like extremely decreasing. So, um, as I said, I, I just quit being active in the fingerboard scene. And then I remember also the fingerboard.de forum was closed that time. So the place where we all have been connected, all fingerboarders in Germany has been away. So um, there was missing something to, to you know, reunite. But yeah, that was that moment when I started you know, selling off all my stuff, my collection. And I remember the last time I was 2014 at ASI Berlin. I, I just um, saw TKY and just gave him gave him my and gifted him my my last decks because you know I was quitting with all that. So um, yeah, that was kind of break for Dwood, let's say, because I was you know many years then busy with becoming an adult. So when did you end up getting back into the scene? It started in 2000 by the way i was i was not quitting with fingerboarding i was still fingerboarding myself and sometimes i was doing decks but you know not really commercial and and public but i remember in 2021 i saw um some fingerboard content online and i was like yeah you know getting second spring because uh you know my whole childhood was filled with fingerboarding so um it was it was uh, nice to see that content again and then i was like ah slowly getting back into it and then i remember 2021 uh when we had covid and so on i remember i was in berlin and I thought okay why not check out if asi berlin is still existing and then i went to the to the store and just met tky after a long time 
and um, I remember we, we had all these face masks and so on and, and then we went back to into their uh, you know fingerboarding room and just had some fun and uh, yeah it was really nice and uh, so it was I think like 2022 I decided okay to get active on Instagram on social media because um, until that time you would have no account because you know back then Instagram was not a thing so um yeah in 2022 we started we like kind of came back with d wood um also that time my partner joined d wood and uh she took over some uh yeah some parts of the administration also the whole social media thing as i said i'm not really used to that so i'm really old school uh she's better than that so she's taking that part and um yeah i part of maybe you know getting back into deck making so um but the problem was you know i, s I realized that the market had changed quite a lot so uh, for example you know the decks were getting wider and mm -hmm. shapes changed and um also the the making techniques changed so i was or we both were really busy um with like optimizing the deck making itself and uh coming back into it And uh, we had to, you know, adjust all our toolings to today's specifications and also working on a new mold because you can imagine back in the days we had like 30 millimeter decks. So um, if you press with a an, with an shape that is made to 30 millimeter, if you press a 34 millimeter deck, you can imagine that, for example, the concave is extremely deep. It's just a technical thing. Um, because the wider the deck gets, the deeper the concave is. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we had actually to adjust our molds also, the whole shape. This took us a while. So uh, we were active on Instagram, but we're not really able to provide, you know, decks because we're busy with optimizing everything. So the real point where we came back with officially making decks was 2023. And um, to be honest, we're still like in a process where we try to get into uh, the whole scene and community uh, because, you know, we have been away for quite a long time. So um, it's it's kind of a challenge. But uh, yeah, since I'd say since 2023, we're back with deck making and um, trying to get, uh, you know, closer to today's needings. And um, we still represent the same values that we did like 15 years ago. So every deck is a one of one. Every deck is, uh, you know, unique itself. And uh, we still, you know, do like uh, use special uh, materials, like special veneers, exotic veneers, design veneers. And um, also do all these like tie dyes, bottoms and uh, sprinkle bottoms and so on. So um, this is still our like uh, philosophy that we have behind the deck making. And um, also we added now some, some split plies, which are all hand cut. And uh, yeah, so actually every, every um, decks, yeah, I would say kind of an art and the way how we express ourselves and put in our creativity and yeah. That's about it. Man, that is a story. The fact that, you know, you took the first two years basically and just doing a lot of research and development before you even started making decks speaks volumes. Like, and especially during that time, unfortunately, I wasn't around in the scene during that time. But from what I've been told, it's like there really wasn't a lot of options during that time period. And so for you, you kind of noticed that. You know, companies were producing things, but like you're like taking that and being like, hey, I can make this better or I can make it where it looks better. It feels better. It is better. And so you took it upon yourself basically to notice that, you know, there's definitely things that are missing in the industry and in the market. As an American, like I can tell you, like we'll be the first ones to go buy a mold 
start the marketing campaign before you start pressing decks and all that stuff that is uh fairly accurate and so to really hear you know someone like yourself like literally talking about going the extra mile and putting in that research and development and making sure that you have a product that you can stand behind that you can be proud of is that's a really really great thing yeah it definitely i mean i mean i'm putting uh, back in the days now still i'm putting you know all my passion and love into it um, for me, D wood was never, uh, you know, something that I want to um, make into a cash cow or something. It was never about business. It was never about the money because, uh, you know, it's not big money, to be honest. But I was, as I said, about the passion, you know, I, I grew a passion for deck making itself uh, during that time. And uh, I, I also like a lot of the woodwork itself. And uh, that that is actually what what D wood stands for. You know, you get a unique handmade product, um, which is also uh, not only 100% handmade, which many brands say out there. I know, but uh, when you look closer, then many processes are you know automized uh, by them, by machinery and so on. But uh, let's skip that. Our decks are 100% handmade. Our decks are 100% made by fingerboards. I mean, there's not many brands that can you know say that. Um, so we value that pretty high that everything is made in-house. We don't outsource anything. Every single deck making step is made by ourselves. Maybe I can later break down maybe the, the whole deck making process. So, so you have an insight, but, um, everything is really made by ourselves. So, uh, we don't use any, any manufacturers that help us, or we don't give anything away to like carpenters or whatever. No, everything is really done by ourselves when we put 100% effort into it, 100% love into it. And that's what it is. I love it. I absolutely love it. All right. So if someone like myself, if they're going to go on your site and they're going to, they're going to be a first time, you know, buyer for a D wood deck, like kind of walk us through or kind of create a buyer's guide as far as like, you know, the different shapes, sizes, do you have different wheel bases, kind of walk us through what you have. Yeah, so as I said, you know, G the G6 mold was our um was a big milestone for us, uh, a game changer. And we still have the G6 shape. We still offer it. And um, but we had, you know, since decks are getting wider, we had to adjust the shape slightly. Um, so you don't have when you use like a 34 millimeter, you don't have like a bathtub. Um so we added another shape, which is based on the G6. It's called G7, easy. So um, it is slightly lower. Um, the kicks are the same. So um, all our decks have, um, let's say, medium kicks, whether it's G6 or G7. Um, we got a tiny bit of concave uh, in the nose and tail. Um, the nose is slightly steeper than the tail. Um, most brands uh, say it's because, you know, you get closer to a real skateboard. We don't say this. We say it's because, you know, we want to make the performance and nolly and switch tricks easier um, because these, these tricks are a little harder. So um, we have a slightly steeper uh, nose. Um, however, our um, concave is medium, I'd say. And um, there's a difference in the dips. The G7 has slightly smoother and more defined dips. And um, this is actually something you can best express by pictures um, because, you know, I, I can tell you everything, but you, you can only like feel it or see it by pictures. So, but um, these are the current two shapes that we have, the G6 and the G7. Um, the G6, I, I'd say, um, slightly deeper due to the reason that um, it's uh, specially made for, like, slimmer decks. And the G7 is slightly um, uh, more mellow when it comes to concave. And, um, yeah, then we have, so these are the molds. Then we have the deck shapes. Um, deck shapes, I mean, with that, the, the, outer, the outer shape of the, of the deck. So how it's sanded. And then we got the classic. Um, the classic is actually close to pop cycle. Um, we have slightly bigger nose. The tail is slightly smaller. And um, 
Then we got a second one, which is the shorty. Shorty is actually um, a twin tail, which is a lot shorter. We got 97 millimeters in length. The classic has 99 millimeters in length. And uh, all these decks are available in 32 and a half millimeter, 33 and a half millimeter. And the classic is also available in uh, 34 millimeter. And there's a third shape in the making, uh, but it's not released yet. Okay, okay. Any teasers as to uh, possibly a timeline for that? Um, I think we will release it this year. It's something, uh, something not so common, let's say. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Okay. Trying to get some juicy uh, release gossip out of you. <laughs> Man, all right. So where can people, I know we can buy your... your decks and stuff like that on your website, but do you have any other distributors where uh, they sell your products and stuff like that as well? Um, yeah, so we had a longer list back in the days, but um, we honestly focused a little bit more on sales by ourselves um, because the experience that we made with some distributors, not all, but some uh, that business is sometimes a little, let's say, complicated and time consuming. So we focus a little bit more on sales by ourselves. And it's also nice for us to, you know, be in touch with the customer directly. So it's, it's a big benefit for us. And that's the reason why we are more focused, you know, to like uh, B2C, to call it like this. But um, Yeah, one one distributor, for example, for the States would be Slush Cult. Um, our decks are available uh, in their uh, physical store and also online. And um, we have currently stock uh, at the Finger Shop in Poland. They also distribute our decks. And um, yeah, in the past we had we had a few local skate shops, but uh, it's it's been a while, so I I don't think they have they have any any decks anymore. But um, um, what I should mention also at this point, we we travel quite a lot, so we always try to visit you know skate and finboard related spots like shops and events, and there we also represent our um, brand and we try to announce that in advance. So. You can always hit us up if you see us there. And we try also to um, bring every time some decks with us. So if we, we, we are in these locations, then um, we probably will have something with us. So you can also get uh, some gear. Yeah, I'm always curious as to like, you know, kind of the mindset of how people kind of choose their distribution points and stuff like that. So no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm, I mean, um, you know, from from business perspective, I'm, I'm a big fan, you know, to, to giving uh, stuff to distributors because at the end of the day, <clears throat> it should normally be time saving because you don't have the customer service, you don't, you don't have uh, all the um, fulfillment stuff like the shipment and so on. But uh, from our real life experience, um, we saw that it's uh, sometimes a little bit struggling. So, yeah. Oh, understandable, understandable. And you have a uh, you have team writers, right? Um, currently not. We're working on that because, um, as I said, you know, we are back since 2023 with the deck making itself and just trying to get in back. Uh, in the first, let's say, time of the wood, I had a few team writers. I also had, for example, uh, Valentin Leiber back then. I don't know if you remember this guy, also from Germany. He also won one of the fast finger events, so he was a world champion back then. But um, yeah, since since we are like getting new into it, uh, we are looking for team riders. Um, but uh, I also need to, you know, add at this point that, you know, the whole team rider thing changed quite a lot uh, compared to back then. Um, because, you know, back in the days it was, you know, having a team rider was more like, let's say a, a, a personal thing. So, It was more like kind of family, you know, you had someone that you were, that you had like a personal relation to and um, you, you had someone that was really, you know, passionate about your products. Nowadays, things changed quite a lot. Nowadays, it's more like you're only, if you're a team writer, you're only like an advertising face and, uh, you know, just uh, 
brands only look that you have like a big audience so sales can can be increased and so on and yeah it's a little difficult um because i think for us would be the best maybe mixture of um both so that means that um we have someone that is of course um passionate about our um about our products about what we make um and also you know can represent us at events or online and also you know it would, it would be great to have someone that you know in person that is reliable and uh, yeah so i think a mixture of both worlds would be great um no it makes sense i like it it's uh developing a team and being a team manager it definitely has a lot of pros and cons and stuff to it but having those working relationships with people that are truly invested in wanting to see you grow and see the business grow and see you know just everything move forward in a positive manner is definitely definitely key man this is probably a good time to do our listen to win contest i actually have an have an idea um we spoke before about that you want to announce that or should i uh talk about the challenge yeah i can yeah let me do the challenge and then you can tell them what they're gonna win so okay this is going to be a contest of who did it the best so we are looking for your three piece combination where you're doing a flip in and a flip out so you can do your flip in flip out on a rail or a ledge where you're basically doing a grind or a slide or you can do your flip in flip out on a mani pad of some sort so you can do a flip into a mani nose mani flip out so we're looking for the best three piece combination trick and so this episode comes out wednesday morning audio video comes out thursday morning the deadline is going to be friday 5 p.m eastern or 11 p.m cet time so Get your uh, get your filming in, and you're going to have to do a couple things to get this prize. You're going to have to tag USAFBL, USAFBL underscore FBP, and you're also going to have to tag D Wood Fingerboards on Instagram. So make your reel, make your post, tag those three accounts, and we're going to shift through all of the entries, and we're going to choose one winner to win. Tell them what they're going to win, Johnny. They will win if they make it this beautiful G7 DAC classic shape, 32 and a half millimeter, five ply with the beautiful design veneer and the German flag design on the bottom and also on the top. All right, we'll get those finger stretches in and we will get back to you on Friday with a winner. Man, all right. So, do you have any uh, upcoming projects? Anything that uh, we can leak on the podcast? I know you're talking about a new shape here, possibly at the end of the year. That's true. Yeah. Um, the last steps actually for releasing the the deck shape, um, which will be something you know totally different uh, to that what we've been used to on D wood decks, and um, it's it will be actually a, a pro model deck shape uh from my partner she had the idea so um yeah it uh, will be also um only available in one specific dimension uh, 33 and a half uh, because uh that was like the best performing dimension for us personally after a long time of research as you know as i told you before d wood is about research we take our time so um yeah stay tuned this is uh something that will come i think within the next months and also um another thing i can uh, announce here is that uh we have this year officially our 15 year anniversary so um we planned a special drop uh which will come within the next time um i'm not sure if we will make it this year but uh maybe it will be like uh q4 this year or q1 next year let's see but uh it will be something really big okay and um also uh we just created or recreated a, a youtube channel so uh, what you can see there in the future are uh, insights behind the scenes of the deck making 
and uh, general uh, thing work content. So make sure to uh, check us out. It's Dwood Fingerboards on YouTube. So yeah, stay tuned. All right, so we got an updated channel. We got a 15 year anniversary deck drop. Yeah. That is huge. Like absolutely huge. We're getting ready to come up on five years and I feel like five years has just been forever, but I can never like just imagine 15 years of just like doing your thing. Like that's a, that's a huge accomplishment. That's a huge milestone. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's crazy. I mean, when I, when I look backwards, what I did during that time, what, what different, you know, decks and products I, I, I released and, and uh, what challenges I had also during that time. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. All right. Do you have any uh, hobbies that, you know, outside of fingerboarding that people may not know about you? So just let me drink a little bit. Cause... No worries. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you got to know that I'm I'm working quite a lot. I have a full-time job. You know, D-Wood is only side project. And I got also uh, a few other side projects. So my free time is quite limited. But if I find some free time, I like spending it, you know, like with friends, um, family, and, 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 you know, close people. But besides that, I would say I like, uh, you know, working out at the gym, um, which is less about weightlifting, but more about, you know, you get older, you got to move a little bit, you got to stay fit. And yeah, it's more about that. And um, yeah, besides that, I'm a general car guy. So I like, uh, I like everything about cars. And um, especially, you know, our time in the US, I enjoyed that because, you know, the US car culture is huge. So it was a great time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm sure you got a decent sized list of shout outs, people you want to, you know, give recognition to. Uh, yeah. So first of all, you know, I, I uh, give a shout out to, to everyone that is actually listening to the podcast or uh, watching it in the visual version. Also um, shout out to everyone that supports the award, no matter if it's, you know, by purchasing our stuff or even only, following us on, on social media and showing some love uh, for the work we put in. Uh, also, big thanks uh, goes out to, you know, the whole USA FBL team for, you know, having us and for uh, doing the stuff you do in the States. Also, big shout out to Black River because I think without them, we probably won't sit here together. <laughs> And um, yeah, also thanks to TKY, he created and, and keeps alive the, the mecca of fingerboarding. Um, thanks to Clayton from Slush Cult for pushing the growth of the community in the LA area. And uh, yeah, also thanks to Mike Schneider for making, you know, fingerboarding a big thing in, this, in the States, you know. Definitely. Shout out Mike. Mike's paved the way for a lot of stuff. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I got a few shout outs as well. First off, if you're listening to this before anybody else on our Patreon account, thank you, thank you, thank you for all the love and support. Really helps out the channel. Also, if you're not a member, where are you at? We've got early access, we got subscription boxes and so much more in our Patreon account. We've also got, I want to say like two more sanctioned events happening between now and the end of the year. So we've got the Toronto Six Gates event in Canada going down November 9th. We also got the Phoenix FB event out of Dallas, Texas going down November 16th. So definitely check those out if you guys are in the area. I think that's everything. No, how could I forget? We also launched USFBL decks on our website as well. So those are new and uh, pretty cool stuff. So definitely go check those out. And Johnny, where can people find you on the internet? So first of all, our Instagram, Dwood Fingerboards. Also, as I mentioned before, uh, YouTube. Now we're going to start our journey on YouTube, Dwood Fingerboards. And um, yeah, that's actually it. That are the, the main platforms you can find us. Uh, so make sure to show us some love on our socials and um, stay tuned. Right on. And I'm going to make it super easy for everybody. I'll put those links in the description. So definitely go check those out. Johnny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having us. All right. Till next time. See you, man.